Greetings, everyone. As uh, the inaugural Eugene and Barbara Myers Chair of Head and Neck Surgery at the Mass Ioneer, it is my extreme pleasure and honor to introduce our next speaker. The simplest way to approach a task such as this would be to review a myriad list of the professional accomplishments of this individual. Never drawn to the easy, I will uh, instead take a different approach. I will try to focus on what is the central theme for this important figure in our specialty and in our lives. The one theme and force uniting and typifying the career of Eugene Myers and makes us so fortunate to have him with us here today is that he, quite simply, makes us better. From the time he published his first paper in the New England Journal of Medicine in 1965 as a resident, a copy of which I have here, through his fellowship with John Conley, he made us better. Through his establishment of one of the finest training programs in otolaryngology, head and neck surgery at the University of Pittsburgh, through his leadership of every major society in our profession, he made us better. By the way, he and Barbara served as the human faces to our profession worldwide for decades. And through his son, Jeff, who followed in his footsteps, he made us better. Through all the trainees, all the papers, all the talks, he made us better. He also did it in small ways, by making that phone call that got someone a position on a committee that jump-started their career. He did it by sharing his failures as well as his successes. He did and does this not for accolade, not for gratitude, not for credit. He makes us better because he can and because it is the right thing to do. The true north of his career and of all his accomplishments and of who he is, is that he improves us in every way and that we are very privileged in knowing that when he's done speaking to us today, we will all be just a little bit better. And so it is my great honor to welcome and have come forth Harvard Mass Ioneer graduate of 1965, Dr. Eugene Myers. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Dan, for that wonderful uh, introduction. I really appreciate it very much. It's a great pleasure to be here today and to uh, uh, have a little uh, talk uh, with this uh, wonderful, uh, almost sellout uh, crowd that we have here. It's very, very impressive. Uh, you see a picture of my son Jeff here. I don't know if you know about it, but he's the uh, Orlando Ballantyne Professor and Chair and uh, Chair of the uh, Head and Neck Service at the uh, MD Anderson Cancer Center. Uh, his department. Uh, was rated number two in the nation in the U.S. News and World Report. So it sounds like he's doing a pretty good job. Uh, I uh, initially went into medicine uh, because I was fascinated with otology, mostly because of my father's influence, who was one of the uh, pioneers in middle ear surgery. And um, from the very beginning, uh, otology is what uh, uh, fascinated me. I uh, uh, decided to um, become a uh, otolaryngologist and uh, decided to uh, come to uh, Massachusetts Ioneer Infirmary for my uh, training, which was uh, a wonderful, uh, very a good decision that I made in my own life. Uh, once I was uh, here, I uh, decided that uh, I would uh, pay a lot of attention to the otologic uh, training, and I had already met Dr. Shuknek before uh, he came here when I was uh, interviewed when he was still at the uh, Henry Ford Hospital. So uh, I chose the uh, title of uh, uh, Solicitate uh, Ototoxicity uh, as my uh, theme uh, this afternoon uh, because uh, I thought it would shock you because uh, <laughs> I, I think the shock value is such because I think everybody recognizes me as a uh, head and neck surgeon. 
So why talk about uh, salicylate ototoxicity? Uh, again, I have nothing to disclose except the extreme pleasure of being here today. And so um, I just wanted to tell you that I don't know how the rotations are arranged now, but back in the, those days, uh, the second year residents were assigned to uh, be the ENT consultants at the Massachusetts Eye and Ear Infirmary, which I thought was challenging. So um, my, I was luckily got promoted from the first to the second year. So my first day on the job, I was consulted in the case of a teenage girl who was a patient on a rheumatology service. She'd been given a large dose of aspirin as a means of treating a rheumatological disorder and had suffered a substantial hearing loss. Uh, I examined her and the physical examination was normal. I ordered an audiogram which revealed a bilateral sensory neural hearing loss of 30 decibels but with good discrimination. So when I re reviewed her chart, I also noted that her blood salicylate level was 30 milligrams, which is about the same uh, uh, th as the uh, decibel uh, amount in the uh, audiogram. So I was uh, really surprised because I didn't even know there was such a thing as a blood salicylate level. So I'd never seen such a case, and I, uh, but the, Dr. Shuknek was involved with uh, uh, in introducing uh, streptomycin treatment for uh, Meniere's disease, and we knew uh, many times, having seen those patients, that they had an irreversible uh, uh, hearing loss. So, uh, but I felt that the uh, I was suspicious about the aspirin intake and uh, being the uh, culprit in this case. So I asked that they stop it and uh, that another audiogram should be repeated in three days. But I knew nothing about salicylate toxicity. Like I said, it was just on the job the first time in my second year. So what I did is I. Uh, uh, headed over to the Mass Eye and Ear Infirmary Library, and I asked uh, Charlie Snyder, uh, who was a very reliable librarian, to help with the finding the literature on the topic. Well, the literature on the topic was scanty and didn't really include even uh, include audiograms, so um, I uh, didn't uh, feel that I could uh, fulfill my role as a consultant at the uh, prestigious uh, General Hospital with this. Uh, level of knowledge. So my next step was to ask our faculty about what they knew about the problem. So I asked Dr. Shuknek, he said he didn't know anything about it, just blew it off. I then asked uh, Bill Montgomery. Bill was my role model. He was the reason that I decided as a second year resident to go into academic otolaryngology rather than private practice, follow Monty's footsteps. Uh, but Monty didn't even know anything about this salicylate ototoxis, and I asked several of the private staff members, and they didn't know anything about it either. So three days later, they repeated the audiogram and showed the patients, lo and behold, like magic, the patient's hear hearing was normal. And so I reassured the patient, I suggested to the attending physician that uh, the dose of aspirin should be decreased or stopped, and she needed it, maybe needed a change to different medication. So um, having um, gotten the information that she was uh, back to normal hearing, I breathed a huge uh, sigh of relief. But really, the, the, the curiosity of this being a reversible uh, hearing loss really uh, got the best of me. I was determined to find out what the mechanism of this uh, unique reversible hearing loss was. So I made an appointment to speak with Dr. Marion Rope. She was a, a senior doctor and a director of the rheumatology department at the famous uh, Massachusetts General Hospital. Amazingly enough, she was willing to talk to me, just a you know, second year ENT resident, about what she knew about aspirin-related hearing loss. Well, um, when she explained it, it turned out that the uh, rheumatologist uh, for many, many years had used aspirin-induced hearing loss to establish the exact dose of aspirin, which would be, the ther would be therapeutic, knowing that the patient would later regain their hearing. So I felt kind of stupid that, that this was going on, on and on for years and years, and uh, somehow or another, our people didn't seem to know about it. So I thought to myself, I'm going to investigate this further. So I went back to Dr. Ropes with a plan and asked her if we could use her patients who were to be admitted to Mass General for treatment with aspirin in a uh, clinical study. The plan of my clinical study included pretreatment audiogram, another audiogram to demonstrate the aspirin-induced hearing loss, and a post-treatment audiogram to demonstrate that the patient's hearing returned to its pretreatment state. Dr. Ropes agreed to let us use their uh, patient, 
because she realized that no study had been done. So then I went back to Dr. Shuknek and I explained that I wanted to do a clinical study at Mass General and a basic science study at Mass Eye and Ear using squirrel monkeys. The Joel Bernstein, who was a first year resident at that time, volunteered to help with the clinical aspect and I would train, I trained the monkeys to respond to sound. Well, one might wonder, how does a second year resident know how to train monkeys? Well, it turned out that uh, when I had uh, interviewed with Dr. Shuknek at Henry Ford Hospital, uh, he showed me around his department, and at, at that time, they were training uh, monkeys and cats to respond to uh, electrical uh, stimulation in order to uh, test their hearing. And not only test their hearing, but to uh, train them so that they responded to sound, and that would give you the opportunity to have a uh, autogram or a monkey. So, um, uh, Dr. Shuknik had brought a, a technician with him from Henry Ford, and uh, I went to him and he taught me how to train these monkeys to respond to sound producing an audiogram. And then uh, I uh, uh, determined that Dr. Sando, who at that time was a uh, fellow in uh, temporal bone histopathology, uh, who I was studying histopathology with, uh, would examine the monkey's temporal bones, and then Dr. Kimura, who was mentioned uh, earlier on, uh, to do electron microscopy on the monkeys. So uh, I also uh, mentioned to Dr. Shuknek that I had filled out an application to the NIH for a grant to cover the expenses. So Dr. Shuknek was a good sport, and uh, he, he signed it, and uh, luckily we got the grant. So uh, we studied uh, and carried out the study at the Mass Eye and Ear and Mass General Hospital Rheumatology Service. gave they gave the patients in the hospital increased doses of aspirin until high pitched tinnitus and the subjective hearing loss were noted. Uh, it took about six to eight grams a day of uh, aspirin uh, to achieve this effect. Then we did uh, audiometry before, during, and after the treatment, and blood salicylate levels were determined during this period of time. All the patients in the study returned to their pre-aspirin pre uh, treatment uh, hearing level within three days. And we, we published this uh, paper in the uh, archives of uh, otolaryngology. Well, while uh, this uh, clinical study was going on, every after, in, in those days, as a, uh, a consultant and so on, we have plenty of spare time, especially in the afternoon when we're waiting for the patients. Lo and behold, they had, we had, used to have patients come in the day before surgery, not like today. So uh, every afternoon I would uh, train these squirrel monkeys to respond to sound and did audiograms on them. And once I trained them uh, and did the audiograms, I injected some of the monkeys with uh, sodium salicylate and waited till the animals recovered after a day or so. And then I noted the uh, uh, hearing and let one group of monk animals recover their hearing, and then I sacrificed the other group of monkeys during their hearing loss in order to try to determine the mechanism of this reversible hearing loss. We, we knew about other to ototoxic drugs, and uh, most of them were uh, permanent except for salicylates and uh, quinine. Uh, the uh, sites of damage uh, were in, uh, mostly in the uh, cochlea, and uh, salicylates used in large quantities, especially as aspirin, were therapeutic, as it turned out, with Dr. Ropes. Uh, also, treatment of rheumatic fever and other connective tissue disorders. The aspirin uh, relieves pain and has a general moderating effect on these disorders. They're readily absorbed from the intestinal tract, and uh, the hearing loss of 20 to 30 dB in tinnitus is uh, not uncommon with a, a uh, therapeutic. Uh, salicylate level of uh, 20 to 40 milligrams. Before, because these symptoms are reversible, they're used by rheumatologists, as I mentioned, in order to establish the optimum dose of medication. The um, uh, hearing that you can see here uh, is, I think there's a pointer on here someplace. Anyway. The, uh, as you can see here in the uh, audiogram, uh, there were, um, there's, ah, okay, thank you. So uh, here you can see the uh, uh, normal hearing in this patient, and here you can see uh, during the uh, aspirin treatment, and then returns back to uh, normal. 
it returns back to what the patient's pre-treatment audiogram showed. It didn't return to normal, for instance. In this patient who had a high tone uh, hearing loss before, uh, had a, uh, a hearing loss induced by the aspirin and then went back to the pre-treatment audiogram. The same is the case for these other uh, abnormal uh, audiograms. So um, um, uh, Joe Bernstein and I studied the effect of salicylates on 10 behaviorally trained squirrel monkeys and after we obtained baseline audiograms, the animals were given a subcutaneous injection I mentioned this uh, before, and uh, here you can see a picture of this uh, uh, monkey. What we, the way we did this is we had a, a cage that was hooked up to elect a electrical shock source, and right in the middle of the cage was a little uh, a barrier. It looked like a, a, a squash a tennis court. And here you can see the monkey just sort of sitting there. And then what we would do is to give a real boom, real loud sound. And the monkey would look around, start and we'd give it a boom, another loud sound. And the monkey would look around. And then with the third loud sound, we pressed the button, shocked the monkey, and the monkey jumped over to the other side of the th this uh, barrier uh, in order to escape being shocked again. And so we, it, it, we did this three or four times. And then on the f fifth time, uh, we uh, went boom. And, and but didn't give any electrical shock, and the monkey jumped over. So we knew that the monkey was uh, habituated to this uh, 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 way of uh, dealing with it. And what we did then was to go from the loud boom down, 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 down until until we had a uh, very good uh, audiogram, normal audiogram on the monkeys. And then uh, what we did was to. Uh, sacrifice uh, half of these monkeys, and we sacrificed them uh, during the time that they uh, had the uh, solicitate ototoxicity. Uh, it, it turned out that, uh, as one would suspect, that uh, electron microscopic uh, studies uh, failed to show any abnormality in the sensory epithelium, uh, the cochlear neurons, or the stria vascularis, and so we speculated that solicitate intoxication is a temporary biochemical change rather than a pathological change, and it interferes with the enzymatic activities and neither the hair cells nor the cochlear neurons are damaged. And uh, here you can see this is the average uh, threshold, the normal uh, threshold um, here, the monkey's normal audiogram, and then w once the uh, solicitate uh, toxicity was uh, induced, the monkey w hearing went back down and then return to uh, normal uh, after uh, three days. And uh, here you can see a photomicrograph of monkey uh, cochlea at, at the time of uh, solicitate intoxication. And here you can see the organ accordion, in the hair cells, and the stria vascularis uh, look uh, perfectly normal. Uh, this was Dr. Sando's uh, contribution to our study. Uh, this is Dr. Isamu Sando, who was a fellow with Dr. Shuknek back in 19. 63. Uh, he later went to the University of Colorado. Uh, we maintained our friendship over the years, and when I became chairman at the University of uh, Pittsburgh in 1972, Dr. Sander was the first one uh, who uh, I recruited and uh, kidnapped him from uh, University of Colorado. Uh, the electron microscopy, as I mentioned, was also uh, perfectly normal. Uh, that was carried out by uh, Bob Kimura, who is a uh, PhD in our department uh, here, and uh, was uh, very uh, regarded as a very uh, highly, uh, um, uh, highly uh, regarded uh, um, electron microscopist. So what's the mechanism of action of all of this? Well, the cause of the hearing loss has still not been determined. Uh, speculation includes that the perfusion of the inner ear fluids with salicylates from the bloodstream changes the electrical conductivity. It's possible, though, that since most of the direct current potential in the stria is uh, thought to arise from metabolic activities, that the effect of salicylates may be on the stria vascularis, decreasing its electrical uh, tension. Uh, Herb Silverstein, or maybe I should call him Herbie, Herb Silverstein uh, studied the effect of a single dose of salicylates on the electrical activity of the cochlea in uh, cats. And this further uh, 
promulgated the idea that uh, salicylate toxicity uh, interferes with uh, enzymatic activity in the hair cells and cochlear neurons. And a few other studies have been done, but no, nobody's really come up with anything more than the speculation that this is a biochemical um, type of a change. Uh, the same uh, type of uh, reversible hearing loss is seen with uh, quinine uh, use, and uh, our uh, conclusion was that uh, uh, salicylates is only one of two substances that produce reversible hearing loss, and since histopathological studies haven't demonstrated any structural change, we post postulated a biochemical change in the fluids which causes a reversible toxic effect on the inner structures. So when the body eliminates these toxic fluids, then the hearing returns to uh, normal, and we know that uh, rheumatologists continue to use uh, uh, aspirin as a, an effective way uh, of uh, treating different types of rheumatological problems, understanding that the uh, hearing loss is uh, reversible. So um, the, uh, let me see, how do you reverse this thing? Uh, so you might um, wonder why, how do you set this thing back? You have another, you have another weapon here? So, uh, uh, so the, what's the point of all of this? Why am I bothering you with the, talking about aspirin and salicylate toxicity and that sort of thing instead of telling you about uh, radical neck dissections and that sort of thing? So the point is that the uh, culture of the Massachusetts Eye and Ear Infirmary had been jump-started by Dr. Shuknek's presence just before it began by residency. He moved from Henry Ford to uh, Mass Eye and Ear the, the year before I started. I was in the first... Uh, resident uh, class that he had chosen uh, personally. So, but uh, uh, research had not been part of the uh, culture of uh, the Massachusetts Eye and Ear Infirmary as far as residents concerned until Dr. Shuknek uh, be, uh, began and introduced it. So the introduction of research as part of the residency training program was a real game changer and it attracted a stream of residents who later become leaders in our specialty. My personal experience of receiving exceptional support from the faculty and staff at both the Massachusetts Eye and Ear Infirmary and the Massachusetts General Hospital as we endeavored to uh, unravel the mystery of salicylate toxicity was profoundly impactful during my early residency. And later, this experience served as a foundational model in shaping the development of my department at the University of Pittsburgh. So thank you all for your attention, for your support, and for allowing me to be here today for this uh, remarkable celebration.